Amen. If we can begin to find our seats this morning, let's sing that song. There's a king who reigns. There's a king who reigns over all of my tomorrows. There's a king who reigns over all my yesterdays. There's a king who reigns over present circumstances. for coming out to Sunday School this morning. We're going to continue our series with Pastor Greg on uprooting rejection. There's Sunday School for all ages, also Spanish-speaking Sunday School as well. And we'll open in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for all that you're going to do, setting your people free this morning, a spirit of liberty. We thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning. You can open your Bibles to Psalm 27 if you'd like to do that. Uh, we're going to continue our series we started last week on uprooting rejection. And uh, I know that all the people on the impact team, none of you are going to nod off during this class, I know. We started this series called Uprooting Rejection. We're looking, the entire series is looking at the principle of rejection. We're uh, talking about when we get disapproval or a lack of value from other people. And we're looking at it because the, the root of so many unhealthy and destructive emotions, uh, mindsets, reactions, choices, is uh, in my many years of pastoring, 35 years of pastoring, I discover that often there are roots in people's lives that are producing these unhealthy fruits. And so we're, uh, we're going to be looking at some of these roots. We'll take our time in doing this. And I emphasize to you, we are talking in, about the past, of course, in numbers of these lessons, not based on psychology, but where we're aiming is what is needed to uproot rejection, you need a supernatural deliverance. That is a power encounter. God will help you, but mostly you need truth. And uh, you're going to see in this series the connection between lies and rejection, and we'll bring the truth of God. So, doing that, we're going to speak today uh, about the home, the most common place that people experience rejection is in the home, and I'm talking about in birth or uh, raising in the home or lack uh, thereof, lack of a home life. And uh, so uh, I appreciate, I want you to understand that I know for many of you this is not just going to be information. I, I understand some of the things we talk about will be painful. It is not my intention to hurt you. But like a surgeon, sometimes you have to be cut in order to be healed. And so that is the purpose. So we're going to look at how God can heal us in the, uh, of rejection that came from the home. This will actually be a two-part. We won't finish it today. And so we're going to talk about rejection in the home, part one. Let's look at the scripture, launching scripture, Psalm 27, verse 10. Even if my father and mother abandoned me, the Lord will hold me close. Okay, and as we pointed out last week, this shows us, uh, the writer of this psalm, understand that it is possible even in the home for there to be, and he calls it abandon, and I think this is the New Living Translation, uh, forsake in the King James. 
So there is some form of rejection, but he said the answer is God. So rejection of the home. Let's begin and talk about this thought of rejection of the home as we begin. God has designed family to be the foundation of human relationships and personality. In other words, the bedrock of your life or everything that your life is going to become in many ways is connected to the home. And that is the way that God uh, intended it. And so uh, we're talking now about God's intention. God wants family and the home to be a place of acceptance, right? There's, there's something about this you understand in the home or your parents, that is where you're supposed to be accepted. I try to be friendly, make connection with children. Uh, Nate and Ashley, I have my task cut out for me with their twins, trying to get them to like me. And so when I come near them, what do they do? They cling to mother or father. That is an instinctive uh, uh, reaction because this is where I'm accepted. I don't know who this guy is trying to smile at me, but here I'm safe. And that's true in uh, most children to some degree. So let's talk about in a perfect world. Okay, and many of you, you say it was nothing like this, but in a perfect world, the home should be both a mother and a father. Okay, I know this is 2021. I, I shouldn't have to say this. Mother and father should be a man and a woman. Right? If you think Heather has two mommies, that's not correct. So, perfect world, there should be both Mother and father, and I'm speaking biological uh, as well. That's a perfect world. Secondly, that in a perfect world, both mother and father would want the child that they created. That is God's uh, intention. Thirdly, in a perfect world, both mother and father would raise the children. There would be presence. They would be in the home, not absent. There would be provision so supplying what is needed in life and in the home, the raising involves instruction, teaching children. You are not simply minding the child, you are actually instructing them for life. That's a, God's intention. Fourthly, in a perfect world, both uh, father and mother would love the children. The children would know that they are loved. The parents with words and physical affection would demonstrate that the child is loved. And finally, in a perfect world, the child would, or both father and mother, they would accept the child. And what I mean by that is their love would not be based on performance. I love you if you do right, or I love you if you uh, achieve or, or whatever. Okay. When those elements of God's design are present in a healthy family and healthy relationships, it provides powerful things inside of a person. And these are absolutely instinctive. We spoke in our first lesson about the issue of identity. You gain your identity. People are, we, I told you a story about a young man asking, who am I? I don't know if you understand this. In the home is where your identity is first formed. Some of you, your children, you have nicknames for your child. You call your daughter princess or uh, come on champ. You're actually giving them an identity. This is who you are, but it, it's connected to Value and so in a healthy home, people first form. Obviously, you got to work this out in life and experiences and choices, but identity first comes from the home. Confidence. If you see children that are very confident uh, children, often they're raised in a very healthy home. It's instinctive, it's in there because they have learned. There's safety. 
I don't have to live in fear in all of life because um, my worth and my value, and I'm not talking about what other people think of you, I'm talking about how you see yourself. Human worth is really what do you think you are worth? We talked a little bit about that. And then there are reference points in the home that are formed. When, when I married Lisa, there was a great advantage. I did not have to go find a book to find out how should I treat my wife or when uh, uh, Emily was born, I didn't have to get a child rearing book. How do you treat a child? There were things I had seen reference points my entire life. I was treated a certain way, so there were things that were instinctive, and we learned reference points. And finally, in the home, you learn boundaries. Boundaries are a very important uh, uh, issue in life. This is why parents should set boundaries and limits. You learn that in the home. And uh, you understand that children, they will act in many ways. Part of the job of parenting, train up a child means to narrow. You set limits. You will not act like that. In our home, if you were upset about something, you were not allowed to sit at the dinner table and pout. Right? So we would come to the dinner table, and because I was mad, we would put our hand over like this. We didn't look at people, and we would eat like that. And my parents would lovingly say, if you want to keep your arm attached. <laughs> no. That you're not going to act like this here. So, but that's a life limit. You can't just act any way you want. There are people that they, you know, on the job, in, in uh, relationships, in ministries, in church, they act out because they've never learned limits. You will control your emotions. So, all of that is the perfect world, right? If there is both father and mother, and if they will love and instruct and accept and put boundaries, etc., etc., then that will help a child, as they grow into adulthood, they have a great advantage. I'm not discounting every child has to make their own decisions. You can raise a child perfectly. They can choose to be a rebel. That's on them. I understand that. But I'm talking about God's intention. So, of course, everything that I said, for some of you, that is not at all what you experienced. You did not have some of those elements at work in your life. So, the home for many people is the place where they experienced their first rejections in life. And in fact, for some people, the greatest rejections they will ever experience in their life will be in the home. Let's read the, our main verse, Psalm 27, 10. This is a New Living Translation. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Okay, this is put in the Bible because that is what many people have experienced. Father or mother or both have abandoned, whether that is literal, they were not around, whether that is emotionally, they didn't show love and affection, communication, whatever it was, there was an abandonment. In fact, if you think about it, the Bible has numbers of stories of rejection, people that were rejected in the family. And the reason why is God knows that this will be a common occurrence in a fallen sinful world is people will experience rejection. So, Let's look at some of the ways that uh, rejection comes uh, in the home. And we'll go through these. Uh, part of the issue is when I'm talking with people about rejection, they are thinking only in one area and they say, no, I wasn't rejected. I had a mother and a father or, uh, you know, different issues. So let's look at numbers of ways. And the point of this, I'm quite certain most of you, you didn't experience every single one of these. But somewhere in this list, I bet you're here. So this is to identify 
What we're identifying is roots so that we can ultimately get healing. So, first rejection you can experience is your birth circumstances. For some people is their birth was not wanted in, in some way. That can be an unwanted pregnancy uh, for different ways because of age, your teenager, fooled around, got pregnant, and this is not what I was wanting to uh, happen. Of course, you can have uh, ladies that are older, they didn't want a child because of their age. You have children, they're conceived because of an affair, incest, rape, of course, those are terrible, the worst possible circumstances. But then there can be just simply because of finances. You have people that they have numbers of children, Having another one is stressful financially. And so this doesn't mean they're evil or they're going to hate the child, but it's just like, I, I don't think I want another one. And uh, others, because of a life plans, I wanted to be, I wanted to have this career. And so now this pregnancy has uh, changed. And then, of course, you find people, some are given up for adoption. The reason why that is important is that, I can give you scientific studies, that feeling of the child not being wanted, the baby can feel that in the womb. This is very, very important. It is uh, a, a big deal because the child feels that. And you have children that are born and now a door is open because of that feeling of not being wanted. You have some uh, children that... The, there was disappointment over the child's sex. Dad was determined to have a football team. And he had a girl. I wanted a boy. No, that's not uh, happy. You have uh, women that they're going to have a baby. It's a boy, but the problem is she hates men. And so this is something that there was a disappointment. You were not what the parent wanted. There's a second type of family rejection, that is inherited rejection. Some of you have wrestled with this issue that you know that your father, mother, or both parents, for whatever reason, in whatever way, they let it be known that you were not wanted or they did reject you. And you deal with that, whether that's bitterness or messes with your head. But you know what? Parents that have a root of rejection they usually pass it on. Unless the curse is broken, they generally pass it on either spiritually or they literally pass that on. For some of you that you're struggling, my dad, my mom, but if, if you would have mercy for a moment, your parents also were born into rejection. That's all they knew. And so it's difficult without the gospel, it is very difficult and rare for people to break the curse. And so there is inherited rejection. Some of you will recognize this. What you experience, your parents experience, grandparents, it's just been passed on through generation. Third issue is abandonment. And now we're talking about a parent or both parents that leave the children. In our society, there are people, they really like making babies, but they don't want to raise the child that they, uh, that they created. And so you have this, the, the man said, I'm out of here. I'm not helping to raise, or it can be the reverse. You have children that have experienced this, one or both parents, they ran away because of stress, because they were having an affair, because of selfishness at some point. They abandoned and left uh, the, uh, the family. Then divorce. You have people, they're fighting with each other. Man and wife are fighting, having conflict. And so I can't take it anymore. So I'm leaving you. But they don't just leave you. They leave the child. And this causes uh, all kinds of, of stress. A few weeks ago, I heard an interview, unfortunately, I, I came in, I don't know at what point it was, in the interview, it, I, I gather from what they were saying, I only heard a, a, a couple of uh, minutes of this, I gather this was a rapper from the 90s, I do not know my rappers. 
okay, except for saran wrap, that's all I know, but <laughs> this was a rapper and they were uh, interviewing him and he was telling when he was a boy, his father was a drug addict. And he said, my dad would tell me, I'm coming tomorrow to pick you up. And he said, I would sit on the step waiting for him and dad would not show up. And he said, one day it had dawned on me, and this is his interpretation. He said, dad chose drugs over me. He loved drugs more than me, and then he went on to begin to describe that then how he treated women, his own children when they were born, how this affected him. Now, that is an interpretation. I don't think his dad literally said, hmm, my son or drugs. It wasn't like that. He was addicted and bound by a demon spirit. But, but this man now, I gather, is, uh, uh, this is many years later, and that is affecting him, he said, Dad didn't want to raise me. Addictions is actually a form of rejection. When parents are addicted to drugs, alcohol, pornography, it often creates a failure to love, to accept, to raise, whether that is selfishness, not wanting to spend time whether that is just they're not around because they're pursuing their uh, addiction. And, uh, and so for many people, that is actually a form of rejection. Addictive parents create instability, right? There's constant turmoil. You got kicked out of the house because you spent the money on drugs or alcohol instead of you got fired from jobs. There is constant instability. One of the things that God meant the home to provide is stability. That you know, all right, the world may be crazy. I can go home. I know what, what the home is going to be like. People didn't experience that because of addictions. And then, of course, that a child receives a message that the drug or alcohol pornography is worth more than you are. Then, of course, there's abuse. People in the home, they did not receive love and acceptance. They were abused, whether that is uh, violence, they experienced physical violence, whether that is verbal abuse, and, and I'm, uh, and that's a whole issue in itself, or whether that is sexual abuse that some people experience. The problem with abuse, it is an absolute assault on your worth. You experience when someone who is supposed to love and accept you instead, if they are beating you, if they are verbally attacking and demeaning you, or if they're sexually abusing, your worth, and I'm talking now about how you view yourself. Some of you, the abuse was many, many, many years ago, but the problem is how you see yourself. I spoke about this last week about girls that choose dirt bags. Why do you not think that you are worth more than a dirt bag? Right? It's not like a girl is like, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a bad decision. I found a multimillionaire. That's not what happens, is it? And so this is a worth issue. There are people I can't because you got a message from abuse that you are not worth something or you get a false message of your, you get a twisted uh, uh, message. This is one of the problems of, of girls that are sexually abused is the message that is given to them that is a complete lie, you are only good for sex. That is your whole worth as a human being. That is a foul lie from hell, but this is, this is the result of abuse then there are harsh words there are people i'm not talking about just uh, you know someone having a bad day there are people that literally over and over as they were being raised they got from one or both parents the words that were spoken what good are you that, that's a worth issue you're getting a message 
that you actually have no worth. You're stupid. We talked about that last week. You're worthless. I hate you. I never wanted you. I wish you were never born. So uh, this is actually something that is, in some people, that kind of abuse is deliberate. Whether that is to demean, to get their way, whether that is a reaction to what's going on in their life uh, as an overflow. But this is what some people experienced in the home. The basic messages they were getting was not you are loved and accepted and valued. Instead, you're stupid and worthless and I wish you were never born. So those are things that then it's going to affect you in your life then withholding love some people i think i mentioned this last week they say but i did have a mother and a father but uh the, the problem was is that you never heard from the parents they were there in the home but you never heard words of love value and acceptance they never demonstrated that uh, love uh, is in some case it is withheld for whatever reason they are refusing to give affection there are parents that they are they got a twisted view of money and uh, you, you I can't give you money I got to teach you to earn it and all kinds of uh, all kinds of strange things I, I knew a man that all his life everything if his dad bought him a pair of shoes he wrote it in a book and he said you have to pay me back that would make you feel warm and fuzzy inside wouldn't it withholding love and then of course connected to that is simply an inability to express love some people never hear words of love and value and acceptance instead what they experienced in the home was coldness their parents are very cold. They're there, but they're cold. There's no warmth of love or inattention. There are parents that the, the mother or father or both, they actually never speak to the child, never talk. You need to talk to your children. And I don't mean simply correction. It's important to speak because you're, you're giving Value, I think I mentioned this last week, a very common statement is when people say, I, I'm sure that my parents loved me, but they just never shared it, or they never told it, or they never uh, expressed it. So that's an inability to express love. And then you have parents that they are demanding and hard to please, which is a form of rejection. So that in some parents, their love is performance-based. I will love you if, if you do right, if you win, if you succeed, then I will love you. But the big problem in life is this, we don't always win. Right? There's not a single person here you've won every time in your whole life. So what happens when you don't succeed? So if love is if, so what then? And this is the message that some people get is, I then have no value because I didn't win or because I didn't do right. Are there any perfect people here you've always done everything perfectly? Are there any angels and I was unaware? No, I don't think so. So that is a, that's a huge problem. Some children, they can never do enough to please their parents. This is what they experienced. Their parents were extremely hard to please. I, I think I've told this story before, but I was reading, this is a true story, young man. He was so good at running track, he was chosen to run in a statewide meet. And out of all of those in a statewide meet, he came in second, which is quite an achievement. When the race ended, immediately his father came up to him and said, how does it feel to be the first loser? That, that's, in other words, it's not good enough. You should have won. So there, it is uh, demanding and hard to please. Finally, and I'm sure that there's some that I'm not thinking of, but uh, finally is uh, favoritism. 
is in some families, you, you have this, is parents have a blatant uh, preference for a sibling. And, and the message that some people get is, why can't you be like your sister? Why can't you be like your brother? And so they experience this. We, this is, we see this in the Bible, right? Uh, Jacob, in the family dynamics of Jacob and his wife, Jacob prefers, and let it be known, the boy that I love is Esau. Why? He's a hunter, he's a man's man, whatever it might be. Uh, but then his wife, right, she chooses Jacob. So this is the atmosphere that they are raised in. We see that Jacob then becomes a shifty schemer and trying to cheat people in life, but this is what he was raised with, is, is uh, favoritism. In fact, in some families, this is actually encouraged. Sibling rivalry. The parents want their children to fight and compete with each other. And they're not just competing to win, they're fighting for love. If I can beat my brother, then you're going to love me. You're going to value, if I can outdo my sister, then you're going to accept me. Those are terrible messages. Some parents encourage this because they say, I'm going to teach you to fight with your brother and sister because that's how you get ahead in life. And they bring this even into the house of God as that's what you do is you, you pull down and you kick and you outdo. That, that is, those are terrible messages. So these, of course, are, and I'm, I'm sure that I'm not mentioning all of them. I'm just giving you a broad cross-section. Any of those events, they produce rejection. And so, we, let me give you a few uh, uh, definitions, um, a sense or feeling of rejection. But So, rejection can be defined as a profound sense of being unwanted or unloved. The word rejection, we say we reject something, that is something that is cast aside to be thrown away or having no value. And finally, is rejection gives us the message. When you experience this in the home, unfortunately, we're getting the message. We have no value or less value. We don't fit. That is what rejection actually produces. Now, in every human relationship, in every setting where there is people, I don't fit. Some of you struggle with this. You come into church, service after service, you look around, but deep with it, this is not based on how you're treated. You look around and there is, you got the message early, I don't fit. I don't fit with these people. I'm not good enough. I'm not like them. But that was a life message that you have received. You don't measure up. Some people just have this basic feeling or sense in their life that, um, that something is wrong with me. That's how they approach this. Something is wrong with me. It must be because this is how I feel. So that is the first place that rejection occurs is in the home. And this is what people uh, have experienced. There may be people that you, uh, some of the things we've talked about, one or maybe uh, more than one, or God forbid that they be all, but you, you got these messages of worth and value. That was not God's plan. Okay, this is the result of the fall when, when man had a fall from his state of grace with God, sin produces this. Sin produces rejected, broken people, and they don't know how to break the curse. And so they pass it on, and they wind up rejecting their children in various ways, and then the cycle goes on and on and on. And as I said, 
The reason why I want to do this series is because I love helping people. And when I see people there acting in ways that are unhealthy or destructive, uh, what I want to know is, why would you do that? How did you get that way? And through the years, I've seen the most common way that people have these things that they're struggling with is rejection. And so we're, gonna, we're going to get to some good news. If I've depressed you, absolutely, if you'll keep listening, we will get to this. Okay, let's talk secondly about, a, about an issue now. Let's talk about the lies of rejection. I, I stress to you, this is not psychology. I have no interest in, I'm never going to put a couch in my office. And lay down and tell me, how was it when you were a child? That, that's, not, that's not my point. Okay. Let's talk about the lies of rejection. The greatest danger when you experience rejection, of course in any form or from anyone, but we're talking about the home, the greatest danger of rejection is that rejection tells lies. When someone rejects you, it's not just, oh, that was mean, it's a message. And often the message you receive is a lie. It's not true, and yet that experience tells us that it is true. Think about this. The devil's greatest strategy in life is to get us to believe lies. Is that right? Eve, her life was changed Adam's life was changed when, first of all, Eve believed lies that the devil was telling. The devil does not have the power to get you in a headlock and make you do anything. His main weapon that he uses against people is if he can tell you a lie and get you to believe it. John 8, 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Father of lies. That is a classic statement from hell. He's a murderer. <clears throat> the devil wants to kill. Of course, he would love to kill people literally, but the devil wants to kill love. He wants to kill marriages. He wants to kill healthy relationships between people, healthy relationship. How does he do that? He is the father of lies. So what the devil wants is he wants you to get a message that is a lie and it take root. Rejection is a root of lies that you get. Look at some of the lies that we believe when we are rejected. Lie number one, you have no worth. There's somebody, this is actually their struggle is, I have no worth. Why shouldn't I cut myself? Why shouldn't I damage and ruin my own life? I don't have any worth. I got that message. It's deep inside. Second lie, it's your fault. There are people that what they experienced in their birth, in their upbringing, they experienced all the rejections. You had a parent that left. Your parents divorced. You were abused physically or sexually. And so the lie from hell is, that was your fault. Is the ugly side of divorce. Is that parents are fighting. They have their own issues. That's not a child's issues. Okay, I'm out of here. The child is the one. The parents will live to the day they die blaming each other. Unless Jesus helps them. The child is the one who says, that was my fault. If I was a better son, if I was a better daughter, mom and dad wouldn't have divorced. That's foul. 
That's, that's a lie from hell. Your abuse, it was your fault that someone abused you physically or sexually. That is a lie from hell. You know what rejection produces in many people? They live all the time with an overall feeling of guilt. Not, not, you know, if you, if you do wrong, if you steal, you hurt someone, you feel bad. That's good so that you get it right. That's not what I'm talking about. There are people that live all the time with this vague feeling of they feel guilty. I don't deserve good things. God blesses them, gives them good jobs, a business, a house. Oh, I, I don't know, man. I, I shouldn't. I, get, I have this money now. And what's wrong with that? But they've learned to feel guilty. Lisa and I, we went to church with someone in Australia that this man, you know, we lived in a hot place, a lot of sun. He would buy sunglasses because you need it when you drive. And he would buy a decent pair. Every once in a while, his roommates had to constantly check the garbage because anything good that he bought for himself it would be a matter of weeks or, or so. He would take all of his stuff. He would throw it in the garbage. Throw it in the trash. Why? I shouldn't have these good sunglasses. <laughs> Why would you feel like that? It, it's just guilt. It's vague. It's not because you robbed a bank. It's because you exist. That is guilt. And that is a lie from hell. Third lie. Your worth is based on your performance. You only have value. You only deserve love if you do right. <laughs> There's a big problem. For all have sinned and fallen short. If your worth is only based on I'm doing good, that's why some people are like, wow, I'm feeling, I went to prayer like three days in a row. But what happens if you sleep in one day? The message you got is, growing up, is you don't have value. Oh, God, I forgot to read my Bible for a day. I got busy. That's, that's a terrible message if your worth is based on performance. I only deserve love. I only have value if I win, if I succeed. Listen, no one wins every day. If you won every time, your head would be the size of Texas. No one could, it's not healthy. I, God won't let us win every time. So that's a terrible message is I only have value if I succeed. And you don't want the drive in many people. I think we'll talk about this later on. But this is why some people are driven to succeed. I will because they have that message. I'm going to show you I'm worth something. And that's, that's not healthy. Fourth message that's alive from hell is you need to be perfect. Rejection in some, it manifests in different ways. For some people, they become perfectionists. Right? Because in, they got this message. I was a bad kid. That's why dad left. I didn't, I didn't measure up. So now... In their life, it's like, I am going to be perfect. Because if I am perfect, no one will ever reject me again. That's not possible. That is an absolute impossibility. That is a lie from hell that you need to be perfect. We have some really flawed people in our church. I, I know one of them. I saw him in the mirror this morning. But having flaws, that is not a worth issue. Yeah, and, and you have to learn this. God has to give you a deliverance so you separate your worth from your performance. And final message that is a lie from hell is everyone in life is going to reject you like your parents did. When you get the message early on, mother or father or both, that they reject you, you often have people in every human relationship, there are people that they are content. They, it was like they were born to fight. Every human relationship, they got their fists up. It's really hard to be married that way, isn't it? 
Honey, I love you. And the moment they say I do, it's like fists up. Everything's a fight. Why? Because they're saying, I know what you're going to do. You're going to reject me. I, I know the people in the church, you're going to reject me. If I get in ministry, you're going to reject me. Everything in life, they're looking because they got this lie from hell. You were rejected by your parents, and now everybody is going to reject you. So those are lies. The, the primary result when you are rejected and the lies take root in your soul is you have an inability to either receive love or communicate love. When you didn't receive love, now this changes. That is what happens. I, I believe a lie, and so now I, I cannot receive love. It's really hard for me, or I cannot communicate or give love. That is true in human relationships. There are people that they struggle with communication. There, there, there are some people that with their spouse, with their children, on the inside, the thought of saying, I ask people in marriage, do you say, I love you? Oh. Do you say, I appreciate you? There's something on the inside is like, it's, it's in there, but I can't get it out. That's, that's unhealthy, that's, that's bondage. There are other people that how they approach all human relationships is never let anyone know what's going on inside. Lisa and I had a, had a friend in Australia that we actually gave him a nickname. His name was Great. Because when you saw him, how's things going? Great. We would hear that somebody died in the family. Great. Lost his job. Great. You, you can't, your head just fell off. How can you be great? Because that was the message. You don't let anybody know. You will never tell. The, the, the thought of ever telling somebody else that you are struggling or you have problems. That, 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 there, there is no way that you would ever be willing to do that. There are people that struggle with affection receiving affection. There are some people that, that don't touch me in their relationships because it, in, in some people, they, this is the, the problem is they have, because of abuse, they equate any form of affection with sexuality. What kind of creep wants to give somebody a hug? What are you, a pervert? No. Right? That's, a, that's a, a, a message. Giving affection. There's a problem. If you were raised with rejection, now you get married. Listen, your spouse, they have a need. They need affection. But there are people, that, that's like the whole idea of like hugging someone. And then, of course, that works out in many different ways. There are people, they struggle with the, with the idea of receiving gifts Give them a gift. It's like, no, because now I owe you something. You don't owe anything. They view life like a scorecard, but, but you paid last time. I have, who cares? That's actually an issue of, I don't like people showing me value. And that's an unhealthy thing. The greatest way that an inability to receive or give love works out is your relationship with God. And this is fundamental. This is what's very unfortunate, is that you can't help it. You transfer your feelings of family onto God. Right? There are people, if you were abused by your father and then you come into church and we're going we're gonna, to... Praise Father God. Like, Father is not, it's like a cuss word to you. Right? This is now a very difficult, okay, dad was someone to be feared. Dad was someone to be avoided. But now I'm going to say, Father, 
This, this is now a, uh, a struggle. Listen, do you know the opposite of love is not hate? The Bible says the opposite of love is fear. Let's read 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Okay. This doesn't say when you don't have love, you have hate. It says when you don't have love, you have fear. And fear is tormenting. But 1 John 4 is actually speaking, this is the famous verse, is we love God because he first loved us. So, it's possible. All of these feelings I'm talking about, they are not a salvation issue. You can be saved going to heaven and yet tormented by fear in your relationship with God. There are, there are people, this is this, this struggle. I'm afraid that God can't be trusted, right? Your parents would let you down. Your parents wouldn't take care of you. So now, hey, why don't you obey God and do what he says? Oh, but what if it doesn't work out? Because your fear is, what if I do what God says and he lets me down? I'm afraid that I don't measure up in God's eyes. This is one of the foul lies that rejection produces is there are people that come to church if i ask you how many of you know god loves you yes but underneath they have this uneasy sense i don't measure up because that's what you experience right that god somehow one day it's going to dawn on god what i'm like I i'm a guy that i miss prayer and sometimes i get upset say bad words, and so therefore God's going to go, you what? Out of here. I can't have people like you in my family, or I have to perform in order to earn God's love. This is why rejection is so destructive. Human relationships and relationship with God. One verse before we close, Luke 15, 29 and 30. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you uh, and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when his, this son of yours that has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. The elder brother is a classic picture of Christians who have experienced rejection somewhere along the line. He is doing the right thing. I've been slaving. <laughs> the idea, I've been working hard. Christians should work hard. I've never disobeyed your order. I do right. Christians should do right. But how sad is this? He's doing this all this time is because if I do right, and I work hard, dad will finally love and appreciate me. Killing the fatted calf or the goat, or what he wants here, this is, this is showing, hey, everybody, I love my son so much, let's have a party. And his father says, but it's always been you. I've always loved you. You could have had it at any time, in actual fact, that was in you that was not in the Father. And that is the problem with rejection, is we believe lies, and then we enter every human relationship, or we're in relationship with God, and those lies have taken root in our soul. So we're looking at this so that the end result is we want those lies uprooted by deliverance and the truth. Now, Unfortunately, after telling you all of this depressing stuff, we don't have enough time to get to all the good news. I'm very sorry about that. I, I wish I could make this a 17 hour long course all in one sitting, but your butt wouldn't take it. Okay, but what I'm going to do, I want you all to bow your heads. This is what I'm gonna do. Some of you in this, you're going to experience a great deliverance. I don't have time to give you all of the truth that, that uh, expose or remove lies. 
But I am going to ask God that during this series, during the week, listen, if you will begin to cry out, I have mentioned some things, you can cry out to your Heavenly Father and say, God, I recognize there are roots. I am asking you, let rejection be uprooted. I want to be able to believe the truth. And I'm going to believe God that even before we get to the next lesson and give you some good news, I am telling you God is going to go to work. Some of you, out of this series, God is going to set you free. So I'm going to pray for you right now. God, I need miracles to take place. God, this has to be more than words. I need you, first of all, God, expose every lie that we have believed in our hearts. The roots of rejection, it's from hell. God, please give people revelation, first of all, so they see it, and they're able to get rid of it, God, and then you're going to meet with people. I'm asking, you're going to bring healing, you're going to bring deliverance. I'm asking for miracles of revelation, Lord God. You are going to help people. Open their eyes and let them see your love. And I thank you for the deliverance and the healing that you're going to bring in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Service will start at 1030.